Changing the human genome, what next for germline genome editing? This pet discussion has been made possible thanks to the support of the Association of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists, ARCS, and the Anne McLaren Memorial Trust Fund. And all of us at PET are extremely grateful to them for that support. Genome editing is increasingly important in science, in technology and medicine. And the pioneers of the CRISPR approach to genome editing were recently awarded a Nobel Prize. The editing of human genomes has potential benefits, but can also pose ethical and regulatory challenges, particularly when the, when the germline, the heritable part of our biology is involved. And genome editing hit the front pages and the news websites around the world for all the wrong reasons um, in 2018, when Dr. Hu Zhang Kui um, revealed that he had used genome edited embryos in a clinical setting and he announced the birth of baby twin girls. And this Chinese scientist had worked secretively and in breach of numerous scientific and ethical standards. And the resulting um, international outcry was tremendous. Um, and he was imprisoned by the Chinese authorities. And human genome editing has hit the news again this week, although in a much more subdued way, I'd say, as the World Health Organization has published two reports and a position paper to help establish human genome editing as a tool for public health, with an emphasis on safety, effectiveness and ethics. And PET is delighted that the WHO, in its report, sees the potential of genome editing to avoid, prevent, treat and cure disease and has set out how to harness this fast moving technology in a responsible way. Now, although the WHO's report tackles both somatic and germline genome editing, tonight's event is just going to focus on germline. So what is germline genome editing? Um, germline is not something that everybody knows what it means. So um, it's the germline genome editing is the deliberate alteration of selected DNA sequences in early embryos, sperm cells, egg cells, or their precursors. And this might be done in research in order to improve our understanding of human biology and development or it might be done in treatment, in which case edits to a person's genome could be inherited by subsequent generations. And the WHO's reports deliver a framework for and recommendations on the governance and oversight of human genome editing. And education, engagement and empowerment is just one of the nine recommendations that the committee has put forward. And I trust that tonight's event will deliver those three E's and that you will join in the discussion, that you'll be better informed and you'll be more confident in your understanding and that you will read the WHO reports if you haven't already done so. And regarding those reports, I have to say, um, I particularly enjoyed the different scenarios that were laid out in the governance framework in which they discuss how to tackle hypothetical situations, some of which I could recognise um, from other areas of medicine, I have to say. And if you don't have time to read the full reports, I'd really recommend you look at those scenarios. And they did, I have to say, remind me of exam questions, but there's a big difference with those because the potential solutions, i.e. the answers, are laid out underneath. This evening, tackling the topic of germline genome editing, we have four experts in PET's virtual examination hall. We have Professor Robin Lovell-Badge, Dr Nora Fogarty, Dr. Pete Mills and Professor Vardit Rivitsky. And Robin is a member of the WHO's Expert Advisory Committee on Developing Global Standards for Governance and Oversight of Human Genome Editing. He's Chair of Trustees here at Progress Educational Trust, and he is Group Leader in Stem Cell Biology and Development Genetics at the Francis Crick Institute. Um, this is the, uh, the committee. Uh, we were chaired by Margaret Hamburg uh, and uh, Dustin Edwin Cameron. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details, just don't have time. But just to, just to please recognise that it was a very international committee, uh, represented all the, you know, the, the, the WHO regions of the world, 
um, and it was a, a very good um, interactive um, diverse committee in terms of expertise as well. Um, this just very quickly summarizes uh, some of the work of the committee. It was, of course, a, a huge amount of work and a lot more than on this slide, but we had lots of meetings and lots of information gathering sessions and many, many discussions with others as well as amongst ourselves. Um, now, uh, Sarah mentioned that, that this meeting is today is mostly focused on uh, germline genome editing. Um, I'm, I'm going to skim through all of the, the, the different aspects just because, including somatic genome editing, be, because, of course, our, our report actually relates to all three areas, as I will mention. Um, and uh, in, in fact, many of our recommendations are common to all three areas. So that's why I, I'm not going to delete much from the, from the talk. So we were the charge from the Director General of Retro covered uh, the three topics, which is somatic genome editing, which is editing typical body cells that are not part of the germline. Uh, the germline, which are eggs, sperm, their precursors, or, or early embryos. And what we generally mean in, in our report about germline genome editing is those, those situations where this is for research, uh, this is not where these are going to be used for reproduction. Um, and then heritable genome editing, we are referring to genetic alterations that are done in the germline, uh, but for reproduction. So em where embryos are now allowed to, to, to develop. And so these may give genetic alterations that might be passed to future generations. Uh, the other charge from the Director General was to address scientific, ethical, and societal issues of governance. Now, clearly, th these three areas, somatic, general, and heritable, have diff slightly different time horizons. So somatic genome editing is already occurring now. Uh, the latest count, there are 126 uh, relevant clinical trials. Germline genome editing, again, the research aspect is already now, and you'll hear, you'll hear some of this later. Um, and then the heritable genome editing, uh, well, there's only been one attempt that we're aware of, and that was Hei zhang attempt, um, uh, but it may be possible in the longer term. Uh, we certainly need to think about all the issues that it brings up. So um, the number of, of outputs from the committee, and I'm gonna go touch on these more, so I'm not gonna dwell on this slide, um, but it, it was, um, uh, we think quite a lot of output um, from, our, from our work. So one of the important things was that we have um, come up with a, a governance framework. Um, and so the framework approach is intended to identify the relevant issues, um, uh, provide a range of specific uh, mechanisms to address them uh, and be developed in, in the, with the widest possible range of, of um, stakeholders. Um, it's supposed to be scalable, sustainable, appropriate for use at, at all different levels, inst from institution all the way to international level. And particularly to work in parts of the world where there's traditionally weaker regulation of scientific and clinical research and practice, in particular in this area. Um, it provides uh, all those responsible for the oversight of genome editing with tools and guidance they might need to um, derive uh, appropriate governance within the jur jurisdiction. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, some of these things. So the governance framework has the introduction uh, section on good governance of new and emerging technologies, governance of human genome editing, um, tools, institutes, and processes for governance, um, the scenarios, which was mentioned by Sarah, Sarah, and then a, a, a section on implementation metrics and review, which we think is, is really important as well, of course. Um, just to highlight that the rules differ around the world for aspects of genome editing, and this is for germline, so research. This is indicating uh, which countries um, allow things. Uh, this is for, for research, not for reproduction. Um, uh, uh, and you'll notice quite a few red countries where it's not allowed, quite a few green, green countries where this sort of research is allowed, and then quite a lot of unknowns. Um, uh, and many of those unknowns have no regulation. If you look at um, the regulations that we can find uh, for heritable genome editing, uh, then uh, you will see many more red areas. So that's many more areas where this is in theory prohibited. Uh, in some places, the, the laws prohibiting this are, are, are not very strong or robust. And I would actually personally include the US in this. Um, it all depends on a small rider to an appropriations bill, basically. 
Um, but uh, quite a lot of areas are red. Uh, there are um, no areas of green at the moment, but there's a lot of uh, places where it's um, uh, uncertain what's really going on. Um, there are a few, couple of areas which are prohibited with exceptions, but I think those are uh, aren't really prohibited. Um, so the, uh, we, um, I guess, were um, following a set of ethical values and principles in our de developing the framework. And those fall into two categories, so they inform how decisions are made. Um, and the list is on the, the list is on your left, and then inform what decisions um, are, are what decisions are made. Uh, and again, you see the list there. So these are all fairly normal um, ethical values and principles. But it was really important to fix our whole process in that. And if you read the report, you'll see we highlight uh, particularly which ones were important for each section. Um, now, uh, there are a number of special challenges around human gene editing, which required extra thought than, than, it was, than I think we think many others have done. So obviously, postnatal somatic human genome editing is one area we're covering. Um, there's, a, there's been a general feeling uh, amongst the somatic, the somatic gene therapy community, oh, they've got this all covered. Actually, in many parts of the world, they do not have it covered. So it's important that this was covered. Um, a more interesting one that's come up um, fairly recently is the idea of prenatal, so in utero, somatic human genome editing, which has a number of special issues associated, in particular because the, um, the, 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 the woman um, also becomes a patient in, in this, not just the, the fetus. Um, we've got, of course, heritable human genome editing. There's human epigenetic editing, where, where you're making changes to gene activity, but not the DNA itself. And then issues of enhancement, which is, which is always a, a complicated, thorny topic. But just remember, you can do enhancement with um, somatic human genome editing uh, or potentially with um, heritable human genome editing. Um, a whole range of different uh, tools, institution processes for governance. Um, these are all obvious, but uh, rarely put in one list like this. Um, and so it's worth um, dwelling on this list, but I really don't have time now. But just to say, you know, we, we think that it's really important that all these are brought to bear in uh, trying to create any jurisdiction, thinking of um, having governance in this area, and we hope all do, uh, that some of these may fit better than others uh, in their, their particular local circumstances. So uh, it, we, we put them all out there uh, and they, the relevant ones should be chosen. Um, the scenarios, um, as mentioned by Sarah, uh, should demonstrate how elements from the governance framework come together in practice, illustrate some of the practical challenges that might be encountered when implementing the framework, explore different facets of the governance puzzle, um, and test the utility of the framework approach. Um, the particular uh, scenarios to do with somatic genome editing, uh, this is here, so clinical trials for sickle cell disease, for Huntington's disease. Um, the whole um, horrible problem of unscrupulous entrepreneurs and clinics, so rogue clinic, rogue, rogue actors, um, and then enhancement, enhanced athletic ability. And then for heritable human genome editing, the one we focus on is where you have a, a, um, a clinic basically expanding their um, services to include um, heritable um, human genome editing. And then we also did one on this uh, prenatal in utero um, somatic genome editing. What I'm going to go through now is the various recommendations that were made um, and go through these quite some of these quite quickly, I'm afraid, because of time. Um, first of all, it's very important that the WHO and its leadership um, take charge of some of these. And uh, we want the WHO and the Director General to uh, demonstrate both scientific and moral leadership by, first of all, being open about the opportunities and challenges inherent in, in human genome editing. Um, so that's the good things and bad things. Uh, clearly stating the ethical aspects of human um, genome editing. Um, and again, to, to accompany all types of, of genome editing. And outlining Importantly, the consequences of failing to address ethical issues before us if we develop and use technologies without prior careful reflection and intentional collaborative decision making. And that's, that's one that applies to any um, new uh, technology and its application. So um, in terms of governance and oversight, uh, we, um, we felt that WHO should collaborate with relevant international bodies, 
including UNESCO, um, et cetera, um, to uh, develop and implement a shared vision for uh, an ongoing international process. And we asked the Director General to institute a cross institutional approach, including um, strengthening, if you like, uh, so there's a, a number of teams within WHO involved in um, regulatory strengthening capacity building and to get them involved um, into integrating human genome editing into their, their activities, convening a, convene a meeting of regulators from member states to, to address all these, these issues, uh, particularly capacity building, um, possibilities for harmonization, even though it's very difficult, and getting international agreements. And then task the science division to convene meetings on human genome editing in each of the six WHO regional offices with uh, appropriate um, uh, individuals and organizations. Um, one of the first outcomes of our committee was actually from the very first meeting uh, where we thought that uh, it's really important to have, if you're gonna have good governance and oversight to actually know what's going on. Um, so the very first meeting we asked the WHO to um, establish a registry of clinical trials um, uh, involving human genome editing. Um, so this was initially launched as a pilot project uh, within the um, WHO's existing international clinical trials registry platform. And um, uh, as I said, this now includes 126 trials. Now, um, there were a number of issues when we were trying to set this up, uh, and we were particularly informed by bad things that have happened in the stem cell field, regenerative medicine field, uh, for example, where um, a number of clinics have basically used uh, uh, clinical trials registries to advertise what they're doing when they haven't actually intended ever to do a clinical trial. And we didn't want that to happen with respect to genome editing. Um, that, that's a sort of one example. Um, also, there are attempts to escape registries and just go ahead without, doing, without um, making aware what you're trying to do. So we try to tackle these. Um, so first of all, we want the right to ensure that clinical trials using human genome editing technology is reviewed and approved by the appropriate research ethics committee um, before inclusion in the registry. Uh, we wanted to be asked them to request that national and regional clinical trials registries make use of keywords to identify clinical trials using human genome editing technologies. This was important because when we first started setting up this registry, it was clear that quite a few, um, there were quite a few trials where they were deliberately, we think, deliberately avoiding the use of words like CRISPR and Cas9, et cetera, because maybe they wanted to hide from those uh, who held patents in these areas. Who knows? But they were trying to keep things quiet. Um, clearly, there has to be a mechanism, an assessment mechanism to identify clinical trials that may be of concern. And then it's important, um, and we asked the Science Division of WHO to do this, to have a regular, regular uh, a committee to regularly monitor the trials registry and develop a, a, a review really a set of international standards for it. Um, and finally, we want, uh, so there has to be, we, we were very keen to have also some sort of register of, of um, germ lime genome editing experiments, research. And, um, so we've asked WHO to support, support members of the scientific community to a, develop an additional um, basic uh, and preclinical research registry for research using human gene editing technologies on human embryos and germline cells or the progenitors. Um, that wouldn't fit in a, in a clinical trial registry, hence that recommendation. Um, obviously, we're concerned about various issues about um, international search and medical travel. Um, and we felt it was important to have um, at least policy statements made uh, about, um, about this. Um, uh, the absence of policy uh, covering human genome editing should preclude any such research from taking place in that jurisdiction. Whistleblowing was a very important issue. Um, it's a very complex one. Uh, we want people to raise the issue somehow if, if they suspect anyone is doing something that's bad. Um, and initially, at least, we, we think WHO should be a place to where concerns could be reported. So this is very important. But the whole community has to participate in this. Um, in terms of intellectual property, uh, we were very keen in, in general in our report that there is issues of social and distributive justice are paid attention to. 
and the uh, intellectual property can play a part in this, but we want the, the, the fantastic research possibilities to be a benefit to everyone, not just people in rich countries. And particularly, it's important that um, when scientists are beginning a project, they think how to make it affordable, uh, not simply how to make the maximum profit for a, for a company. Um, and then there are other, uh, obviously, in education, education engagement empowerment, uh, such an important topic. Um, this is sort of obvious, but it, it's really important that this is pushed and done in a proper way. Um, and we charge WHO for doing a lot of this, at least getting it started. Um, the, uh, also, we wanted to uh, have WHO to integrate uh, ethical values and principles more generally in their work. Um, and this is going to probably going to be accepted, then they're going to try and work on this. Um, and this is this final slide, which is what those ethical um, principles are. So our next speaker this evening is Dr. Nora Fogarty. And Nora is group leader at King's College London Centre for Stem Cells and Regenerative Medicine. And Nora is one of the first researchers to edit genomes of human embryos in order to study the function of a gene. So the work that I'm sharing today um, was work that was performed in the Francis Crick Institute in the lab of Professor Cathy Neocon. Um, and so in, in Cathy's lab, um, we were interested in, we're interested in human uh, embryogenesis. And in particular, we're interested in looking at the key transcription factors, um, signaling pathways and genes that are um, important in the first seven days of, of human development. So we're interested in looking at how we go from the uh, fertilized egg up to the blastocyst. And so this image here is showing an embryo, a human embryo at day six, so six days after fertilization, and this is what we call a blastocyst. And at this time point, we can see the three cell types which comprise the blastocyst. In blue are cells that express the, the transcription factor CDX2, and these are called trophectoderm cells, and these will go on to give rise to the placenta. In uh, red are the primitive endoderm cells, which express SOC17, and these will contribute to the yolk sac. And in green are the epiblast cells, which express the transcription factor OCT4, and these will give rise to the, to the fetus proper. Um, and so in this, in this project, we were interested in um, seeing, could we apply CRISPR-Cas9 mediated genome editing technology to human embryos as a tool to begin to tease apart um, which factors are really critical um, in human embryogenesis. Um, and this, was, this is because um, a lot of what we know about the first week of human embryo development comes from studies in the mouse, where historically we've been able to do these really elegant um, genetic manipulations. So then when, with the advent of, of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology, um, we were keen to see, could we apply this to human embryos? So this project was a proof of principle experiment. We, weren't, we didn't know if um, the technology would work in human embryos, so we didn't know would human embryos respond to um, the introduction of, of CRISPR-Cas9 machinery in the same way that, for example, cell lines do or, or mice do. Um, so it was a, a proof of principle experiment. And for this uh, project, um, we had to select uh, which gene we would target first of all. So which gene would we um, introduce a mutation to abolish its um, function to, um, to show that we can um, edit human embryos. And we wanted to choose a gene that um, we anticipated would have a really dramatic effect um, when we abolished its function. So we would have a really clear readout that first of all, the, the genome editing worked. And second of all, that we could um, tease apart what the effect of, of its abolished expression was. And for this, we chose OCT4. So um, as I said, OCT4 at day six uh, is expressed in the epiblast cells. Um, and we know from uh, studies in the mouse that um, OCT4 has a key role in embryogenesis. And also from studies of human embryonic stem cells, we know that OCT4 is really key for pluripotency. So we anticipated that if we used CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce a mutation in OCT4, that we would have a really dramatic phenotype. 
And um, in the course of this project, the majority of our time was spent actually um, optimizing and refining the methodologies of the genome editing. So we spent about um, a year and a half um, uh, designing the guide RNAs, determining what uh, type of, of um, um, Cas9 we should introduce into embryos, uh, the timing at which we should introduce it. And we performed these uh, optimization experiments in mouse embryos and in human embryonic stem cells. And this was because we really wanted to reduce the number of human embryos that were required for this project and we wanted every embryo that we did use to be to be able to give us as much information as possible. Um, so after we put, we um, determined the optimal uh, protocol for um, at, um, introducing CRISPR-Cas9 into zygotes, we um, performed our first experiments in the human embryo. So this video here is, ho is showing a human zygote, so a, um, a one cell a human embryo. And here you can see we um, used a laser to introduce a, a hole into the, the zona pellucida. And we uh, inserted a microinjection needle into this hole, um, and the microinjection needle contains the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, machinery. And then we, we injected it into the two pronuclei, and we made sure that we could observe the expansion of these nuclei to confirm that we had introduced the machinery into, into the, the zygote. We then cultured the zygote um, for six days up to the blastocyst stage. Um, so this uh, video here on the left is showing our control embryo. So normally we see the one cell will begin to undergo uh, cell divisions and will begin to compact to form what's called the morula. And then it forms a nice expanded blastocyst. Um, so we can see the full expansion of the trophectoderm and then the inner cell mass. But what we found in the embryos where we had edited OCT4 was that um, while initially the embryos would undergo the first um, cellular divisions and would undergo compaction to form the, the morula, what we next observed was that they weren't able to form these nice expanded blastocysts. So what happened instead was that the embryos underwent iterative cycles of collapsing in on themselves, trying to expand again, collapsing and trying to expand. But they never, um, they never were able to generate um, the, the nicely expanded blastocyst. Um, we performed um, genotyping experiments to confirm that we had mutated OCT4 um, at the location where we were, we were um, intending to um, mutate it. And we quantified um, the rates of mutagenesis and we found that we had um, high rates of mutagenesis and um, we had low off-target effects. So this showed to us that we were able to use CRISPR-Cas9 in human embryos. We also performed um, molecular analyses of our embryos to um, investigate um, what might be happening as a result of the loss of OCT4. So here on the left is, our, is a control human blastocyst. Um, the cells which are green are expressing OCT4 proteins. So we can see that we have ex expression of OCT4. And in red, um, so the cells that are yellow are co-expressing OCT4 and NANOG. So NANOG is another marker for the epiblast. So we can see that in our control embryo, we have our nice trophectoderm and we have the epiblast. However, in an embryo that has been targeted for OCT4, so this embryo here is, is actually a mosaic embryo. So we do have still some expression of OCT4 protein. But what we found, even with um, reduced OCT4, we found that we, we had, again, disruption of the trophectoderm and we, we didn't have the proper formation of the inner cell mass. So this shows to us that OCT4 is really critical um, for human blastocyst formation. Um, so to summarize this brief introduction to this project, um, we have shown that CRISPR-Cas9 can be applied as a tool to study gene function and human pre-implantation development. And for us, we now consider CRISPR-Cas9 as just another tool in our repertoire to, um, to, to use in parallel to all the other techniques that we use in the lab to begin to, 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 to more fully understand what's going on. Um, in this first week of human embryogenesis. 
but it's clear that a lot more basic research is, is required to understand um, what's happening in edited embryos. So in subsequent work from Cathy's lab, um, they found that when they revisited these targeted embryos using more advanced techniques to genotype um, uh, targeted cells, they found that 16% of, of all of the cells that were targeted actually had um, quite large deletions. So deletions that were between um, 4,000 and 20,000 base pairs long. So much larger than um, we would have intended. And this work, um, would reinforce the statement from the director general of the WHO when he said that it would be irresponsible at this time to proceed with clinical applications of, of genome editing. Um, so a lot more basic research is required. Um, and then um, I wanted to comment on um, how the WHO report um, impacts me as a researcher in, in human embryo in, in human embryos. Um, and there were um, a number of, of, of points that kind of uh, jumped out to me. So first of all was the, the registry and the recommendation that a registry is, is um, set up to um, include basic research. And for me, um, that wouldn't differ so much from uh, the situation that we have in the UK. So in the UK, all human embryo research is um, requires a license from the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And um, on their website, will it, it lists everybody who holds a license, a brief um, summary about what they're doing. And this is publicly um, searchable. So um, I think that the registry would be, would be good. Um, and also the fact that it would be an international registry. Um, I think the commitment to um, openness, collaboration, sharing protocols and knowledge um, can only be a good thing for scientists um, if it um, uh, reduces duplication of, of, of research and if it um, allows us to, um, to streamline our, res our, our research so that we can, again, reduce the numbers of embryos that are, are used and more importantly, maximize the amount of, of information that we can get out of, out of this uh, limited research. And I think also um, their emphasis on the role of public engagement and education is really important. I think especially in the last um, 18 months, we've seen how um, the spread of um, misinformation and um, lack of um, understanding and engagement with the public can really um, hinder progress and can introduce um, like skepticism of scientists' motivations. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think public engagement is, is particularly crucial in the, in the field of human embryology. And I think the, um, the, the recommendation about whistleblowing is, is probably the most uh, uh, kind of complex because in essence, whistleblowing is a, is a simple complex, a simple, um, a simple uh, idea. But I think in practice, it is, it's, it's tr tricky to uh, implement. And I think especially when it is um, like cross jurisdiction. So for example, um, as a researcher in the UK, um, I'm also protected by the legislation that we have here that protects um, whistleblowers. So I know if I was to raise a concern that I would be protected by law from retaliation or from um, negative consequences as a result of my, my actions. But I'm not sure um, how it would work in practice if I was to whistleblow on, on a, a, a lab or an individual in a different jurisdiction. And I think um, this is probably the recommendation that needs, first of all, needs to be fleshed out. Probably most, um, it's the most time sensitive one, um, because I think until this mechanism is in place, we leave ourselves open to more abuses of this technology. Um, and then I just wanted to finish by acknowledging um, all of the all of my colleagues who worked with me on this po this project. So in particular, um, my postdoctoral supervisor Kathy Neacon and the members of her lab who contributed to this work. Um, our colleagues in the CRIC, uh, so from different labs and also from the different scientific technology platforms. 
Um, also, we had collaborators from the University of Cambridge and the University of Oxford, and then probably most importantly, to thank the the um, the people who donated their embryos to our research project. And without these patients and also the coordination of this donation um, process, we wouldn't be able to do our research. Next this evening, we have Dr. Pete Mills. Pete is the Assistant Director of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, and he's Director of its Genome Editing Work Programme. And he's the, he was the project lead on the um, Nuffield Council report on genome editing and human reproduction, social and ethical issues. I've been given 10 minutes, so I just want to use those to raise or rather distinguish two questions talk about two possible approaches to those questions and then leave on the table two problems that I think of them as raising. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, I am going to talk about um, reproductive uses of genome editing. I know that Robin's already sh shown us that the, the um, difficulties that one can get into with uh, the, the terminology in this area. Um, it's what the WHO documents now call um, heritable genome editing. In other words, the use of genome editing to produce live born offspring. So the two questions that I want to uh, distinguish are, why, firstly, why do we need heritable genome editing? And then secondly, if we have heritable genome editing, and um, it seems very likely that one way or another, very soon, or perhaps in slightly more uh, distant future, we will uh, somewhere, someone will develop heritable genome editing. Then the question is, how should we use it? So the first question is really a question about innovation. What kind of case do we need to make in order to um, make the first use of genome editing? And I'm not actually counting uh, this in this, the use that's already been made of it in China, but I'll come on to that in a minute. The first responsible use of human genome editing. And the second question um, is then when we have those technologies, how do we limit their use? How do we limit the expansion of uses beyond the initial use to potentially many further kinds of application. Um, and it, it seems to me that most of the debate that's been going on around human genome editing is focused on the first of the questions. In other words, why we need human genome editing and what would constitute a good case for innovation. And the conventional answer to this uh, is we need human genome editing because people can't have the kind of children that they want. So what kind of children do they want? Well, they want children that have at least two characteristics. The first of those characteristics is that the children should be genetically related to both of the, the prospective parents, because if they weren't genetically related, then it, it, it would um, obviate the need to secure the second of the characteristics. And the second of the characteristics could be anything that is a genetically conditioned trait that those children might have. But it's, it's often thought to be something like um, not having a genetic condition that is diagnosed in the parents and uh, um, from which those children are at risk of being affected. Um, but it could equally be the inclusion of a trait that is not present in the uh, family pedigree, um, you know, something which may, for example, be a benefit uh, to the children um, over and above um, what their parents might give them in terms of genetic endowment. And when I say children, I should probably say that, um, I mean, I'm talking about offspring in the sense of um, the, the people who are born uh, as a result of a treatment who have a whole life and, and we anticipate will grow up and live a, a, a full life rather than simply the people who are in the early stage of that life. So people, so what, So one answer to this question, why do we need heritable genome editing is that we need, um, we need it in order to secure those two kinds of characteristics. And the reason we need to ask this question is because 
um, it seems trivial to say it, but gene, the application of genome editing um, is uh, in, in, entails a number of uncertainties, and in particular, possibly adverse outcomes that we would want to avoid. So I'm going to now contrast two approaches to this, if I can get the slide to move on. Um, the first of these uh, is um, an approach that I'm going to call the, the biomedical approach. Um, I'm going to refer to uh, the statement from the organizing committee of the second International Genome Editing Summit, um, just because it allows me to use my holiday snaps from Hong Kong in 2018. Um, but I could equally well, for example, be talking about the International Commission that was convened by the National Academies of Sciences and Medicine and the Royal Society that published a report um, just uh, last year on this. What, what you can see from this statement is um, uh, in amongst all the other stipulations that um, David Baltimore uh, was, was making in, in, from the podium. The reason that we need human genome editing is to meet an unmet medical need. In other words, um, a compelling medical need in the absence of alternative approaches that those people could take to secure their, their goal of having a genetically related child with a particular kinds of characteristic. Um, now, in most cases, of course, there may well be alternatives, and they may not be good alternatives, and they may not be alternatives that are likely to achieve the end. But given that we are looking for a, a sort of proportionate reason to um, introduce a new and unproven technique, this has led people to the search for some very unusual cases in which people can't have a genetically related child uh, who would be, for example, free of a, a serious heritable disease. Now, <clears throat> the thing that I want to say about this is it's not clear in such a case that the need really is a medical need because the procedure that is involved delivers um, very little benefit uh, to the child. So what if you're thinking about this as a sort of case of innovation, you're having to um, consider putting a, uh, a child in a situation where it may well um, be affected by the adverse consequences of the procedure that you've carried out without any benefit other than the um, no doubt an important benefit of being genetically related to its parents. Um, so um, in that sense, it's actually quite difficult to uh, use this sort of argument to justify um, the introduction of a new uh, procedure. At the very least, we need to question this approach because it's based on um, assumptions about the force of the claim that people have for assistance in their reproductive projects. Now, and the reason we need to question that is because reproductive claims are presumptively limited um, by the risk that they entail to the uh, future person. My, and my point is not that genetically, uh, that genetic relatedness is an unimportant characteristic. My point is simply that it's not the same thing as treating a disease in an existing person. And it's really that that we need to get hold of. Let me contrast that then with um, the second case. This is the case um, that was referred to earlier of um, uh, He Jung Kui, the, um, what the newspapers would call a disgraced biotechnology entrepreneur. And it was in 2018 in Hong Kong that he announced that he had um, carried out a procedure that led to the birth of twin girls in China um, with edited genomes. Now, his approach didn't fit with the unmet medical need stipulation, and he was anathematized at the meeting for precisely not conforming with those, um, those stipulations. But he wasn't, he, his, his approach, I think, it seems to me is quite an interesting one from an innovation point of view, because he wasn't trying to find the case of most need, because of course, no child um, before its birth needs to be born. But he was trying to find the case of least risk. So what he picked, what he thought, erroneously, one might say, of course, but what he thought was a technically achievable end, and he said this when he was interviewed um, uh, 
at the conference at which he presented his find his results. Um, he he picked a modification that had been researched um, very early on, actually, in uh, the use of CRISPR. Cas9 genome editing in embryos, which was to create a, uh, a deletion at, uh, in the CCR5 gene um, in order to, uh, well, in effect, um, make any resulting uh, children um, immune to contracting HIV. Now, one thing to note about this, of course, is that the parents in this case, might well have conceived a child. Um, he picked parents where the uh, male partner was HIV positive, but of course there are procedures that one can use in order to ensure that a child conceived by such a parent um, would not necessarily be exposed to the disease. Um, so, so it wasn't an, a necessary procedure in order for them to have a genetically related child who wasn't affected by the disease, although, of course, in the circumstances it's possible that they might have found it difficult to access treatment, but, but that's dependent on the kind of social context they were operating in. And the second thing um, that I'd like to note about this is that unlike the avoidance of inherited disease that is diagnosed in the parents, conferring HIV resistance couldn't be achieved um, by using third-party donors, unless uh, there was a, in the very, very rare case that you found a sort of two donors who were homozygous for the, the, the CCL5 Delta 32 mutation, um, or you did some complicated procedure where you'd use heterozygous donors and, and pre-implantation testing of the embryos. But what he was doing, he claimed, was in effect to address a social need um, in other words, to, to create a child with immunity or resistance to HIV in circumstances in which HIV was epidemic in this section of China and highly stigmatizing for those people uh, who had it. Now, one thing to notice about this, of course, is that what he's offering is, it, is um, a technological solution to an arguably social problem. In other words, the, ex the discrimination experienced by people um, in uh, China who are HIV positive. And of course, and it's very important to say that he completely overestimated his own capabilities and was, was completely rightly censured by uh, everybody who was um, present uh, when he made his, his revelation. But the, the contrast between the two approaches highlights what I think is an interesting answer to the first question. In other words, why do we need heritable human genome editing? Um, about whether or not, it, to whom the benefit of that procedure uh, accrues. And it suggests that the answer that's usually given, the answer of unmet medical need, is actually not an answer to this innovation question, but, but perhaps more properly an answer to the second question. In other words, how do we limit the expansion of the uses of um, human genome editing? So those are the two approaches. And I'll just now um, come on to uh, my, my two problems. So I want to draw out um, these, these problems that I think faces when we try to answer the question um, uh, that, it, that provides the sort of rubric for this, um, uh, this, this online discussion, what next for um, germline genome editing? And it seems to me that for, for, for 30 years or so, uh, IVF in the UK has been an established procedure of relatively low risk, and, it, and that risk such as it is, is justified by the claims, the strong claims of people who are experiencing infertility to assistance to help them um, realise their, their aims. And um, techniques like um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, pre-implantation genetic testing anyway, um, to avoid the transmission to the next generation of a, a, a genetic condition have followed on the coattails of IVF. And, and that's probably not cause too many problems because they're merely selective. In other words, they select from among a number of possible children that uh, that given any given couple might have conceived um, and select from among those the ones that um, don't uh, have the, um, the genetic condition from which they're at risk. But I think intervening directly in the genome potentially attenuates the justification um, of uh, 
answering this this um, uh, this claim um, to assistance uh, for in in a reproductive project because of the high risk um, and because what it produces is uh, effectively offspring that that perhaps no couple could have conceived naturally or without assistance anyway so that's the first first um, challenge I think is is the challenge to um, re-evaluate the strength of the claim uh, of reproductive interests vis-a-vis -vis the outcomes for particular uh, for the for the offspring. So this is the second the second problem, and, th and this is the problem of, of, of international coordination. Because if if human heritable genome editing becomes established somewhere in the world, what we will have to face is the question of whether or not to implement it here locally. And in a world in which knowledge, technologies, tissues, people are, are highly mobile internationally, um, we find ourselves kind of sucked into a new socio-technical and, and, and kind of epistemic context, by which I mean that um, the question of why we should do something very, very easily kind of flips around and becomes the question why, why we should not do something, where um, knowledge that is available uh, has to be refused and uh, the potential for acting on it has to be actively refused and those become um, unavoidable moral choices. And that really brings me back to um, the, the WHO committee findings and the um, very welcome uh, injunction to the WHO to provide leadership in this area, which can achieve potentially quite a lot more than um, trying to produce limits uh, uh, th through um, international kind of legal mechanisms. Um, but of course, most, most importantly, it seems to me that the, is, is the promise, most important is the promise of the WHO to articulate the consequences of failing to address the ethical issues um, if, if, we, if we develop and use these technologies in a way that secures broad international consent. But if it does achieve that, then I think the other um, recommendations, the recommendations about governance, participation in registries, whistleblowing, cross-border research, etc., then can come into play. Um, so I think that leadership role is, is, is vitally important, and I, I, I wish them very well in, in, in that enterprise. So I'll stop there. I'll just um, put my slide to say thank you to the um, funders of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, the Foundation, uh, the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust. Our final speaker this evening is Professor Vardit Radvitsky, and she is the president of the International Association of Bioethics. I'd like to start by pointing out that bioethics is often perceived as focused on the risks and concerns of emerging technologies, such as the one we're discussing today, or, about, or focused on why not to proceed. But bioethics obviously is also about why yes, it's about potential benefits, uh, the hope of health and well-being that Pete just described, and especially the, uh, the opportunity cost of not exploring a promising field. I'd like to remind us that already in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is decades old, we acknowledge the right to benefit from the advancement of science and its applications. And therefore a bioethical view of such emerging technologies is about obviously an intricate balance of risk and potential benefit. Uh, and my emphasis here is that proposed limitations on innovation need robust justification. So when I look at the bioethics discourse surrounding CRISPR in general, and obviously germline editing, I think a lot of it has been about what, are, what justifies limitations on innovation. Our topic today is what next for germline genome editing. Uh, and I'd like to propose that before we look at what next, uh, we, look at, uh, uh, we look back for a second, um, because there's an interesting evolution of the bioethical discourse over the past few years um, many reports, policy statements, proposals have been published by several uh, very high profile groups and ad hoc groups. They all express concern over premature and irresponsible reproductive use of genome editing. But the focus of the tone, I think, changes slightly over the years. So I want to walk you through some of these key documents. And I'm very curious to hear whether my uh, uh, fellow panelists agree with my assessment of how the, the tone changed. If you look at the International Summit statement from 2015, we see it talks about irresponsible, being irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use 
until we assess safety and efficacy, until we reach societal consensus. Uh, I think we're still in the same place today regarding safety and efficacy. We don't feel ready. But look at what they say. At present, these criteria have not been met for any proposed clinical use. This should be revisited. If we jump forward two years to the very influential uh, National Academies um, report, um, they're mentioning clinical trials using heritable genome editing should be permitted only within a robust and effective regulatory framework. And they're beginning to give us uh, pointers. Uh, only when the, there are no alternatives, only to target serious disease. So here it's already, we shouldn't do it, but here's what we need to establish, or here are the criteria for potentially moving forward. Um, now I'm going back to Pete and the excellent report uh, from the Nuffield uh, Council in 2018, um, where the focus was on social and ethical issues, obviously, um, with a focus on the social value of the technology and the reproductive choices of prospective parents, exactly what Pete just talked about, um, highlighting principles such as the welfare of the future person, so, so social justice and solidarity. So here, uh, I feel like the, uh, the tone is we need not just scientific uh, safety, we need a societal conversation. So here's what needs to happen on the social level to sort of pave the way to these technologies. And then last year, the consensus study report, uh, again, from the National Academies of the Royal Society, where I really feel that the framing is already much more practical. It's kind of, it's going to happen. What do we need to set up? So the framing is responsible translational pathway. It includes sections such as responsible governance, national oversight, global coordination. And look, for example, at the recommendation about clinical use of heritable genome editing to proceed incrementally, clear thresholds on permitted uses. So here we really already, uh, we're paving the way to reproductive use, and we're looking at the governance, the ethics, the science, everything that needs to happen to make this responsible, which brings us to this week and the launch of the WHO uh, report that I, uh, I'm, and on the backdrop of this very, very quick uh, historic oversight, uh, I'm asking what's new in this document. And I'd like to point out um, a, a small article that was published two days ago. Uh, it's meant for the public to, uh, to understand the meaning and the scope of, the, of these documents that just came out and um, written by two members of the committee. And they say the governance framework, framework uh, lists a number of ethical values and principles many of which have not been included in previous international reports on human genome editing. And look at what they highlight, inclusiveness, fairness, social justice, non-discrimination, global health, justice. They say these principles inform the content of all three reports. So I think that an application of heritable genome editing on a global scale definitely raises issues of justice, equity, access, and inclusion. In the few minutes I have left, I'd like us to uh, dig into this because this may be at a global level coming from a global organization, maybe the most novel aspect of what is uh, presented to us this time. And again, I'm really uh, curious to know what my fellow panelists think about how I presented these previous reports and whether um, this is a fair presentation of what's uh, novel in this uh, new one. So I'd like to, uh, take us through several key questions related to justice. Uh, what substantially bothers us here? What are the concerns? The first one is justice and inclusion or this issue of public debate. All the previous documents that I mentioned and all others, many of them that I haven't mentioned, all agree that the way forward requires public debate, public engagement, even societal consensus. But whose voices are, are heard in these debates? Uh, this uh, committee made a huge effort to consult widely. How do we know that all voices are heard or at least all relevant voices? And beyond that, what power structures shape societal discourse and governance decisions that come from it? That's an issue of justice. Justice and access. Obviously these technologies will be expensive at first. Who will be able to afford these innovations? Who will have access to the benefits? I'm quoting from this uh, article that was published uh, two days ago, unless specific attention is paid to ensuring the development of affordable interventions that can be implemented across the globe, these benefits may never reach the global poor. 
And another aspect of this, obviously, patents. Who holds the keys to the technology and who has to pay for access? And the concern that genome editing interventions risk becoming solidly intertwined with corporate interest and profit, profit motives. Um, another aspect of justice that is very unique to heritable genome editing is the notion of multi-generational follow-up. We're acutely aware that um, any possible adverse effects of genome editing may not be present in the generation that we edited and may only emerge in their children, grandchildren, or even beyond. So the bioethics literature highlighted, uh, and the policy reports, highlighted the need for multi-generational follow-up. But what infrastructure is needed for this to happen? How do we identify those future people whose parents and grandparents were edited? How do we approach them and offer them participation in this uh, long, longitudinal social experiment? Um, how do we ensure that if medical problems do emerge decades from now, somebody picks up the cost uh, of care because we caused them maybe a generation or two ago. So um, how do we ensure uh, justice in the context of safety for multi-generational follow-up, which sounds a, a very important idea on paper, but what would it take to implement it? And lastly, issues of social justice. A lot of uh, ink has been spilled by bioethicists worried that misguided application can, uh, of uh, heritable genome editing can broaden the gap between rich and poor. So what if we use this by parents who can afford it in a private market context for enhancement to pick uh, traits that you know, promote the capacity and the com competitive edge of our children? What happens, it happens after several generations of curating, uh, designing children? Uh, will we eventually create two types of humans? Will we have one population that has been uh, designed for any type of success that you can imagine that we value and another one that's left behind to the genetic lottery? Is this science fiction? Is this a real concern? I don't think we know, but it's definitely an issue of social justice raised by the concept of heritable genome editing. So my bottom line is this, justice should remain a key consideration as we move forward and I hope it will be now a key element that we discuss in the rest of our event today. So this is a question really for Robin, I suppose, from an anonymous attendee, um, but other people may have heard things on the grapevine. Did the committee gather information regarding Lulu and Nana's current general um, state of health? Um, and did they evaluate the role of China's government in, the, in, in that case? Um, one of our committee members is Zama Zai, who's on, who is a... Uh, um, our Chinese representative and who's a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, etc., and an ethicist in China. So she reported what she could, but that's very little because I think, um, unfortunately, the Chinese authorities are keeping everything very close to themselves. They don't want to, they don't want the children identified. They don't want, um, uh, I mean, obviously, they're probably embarrassed about the whole situation. Um, as you know, uh, there was also a third child born, um, by the way. Um, as you know, the um, JK was, has been imprisoned, um, but um, there were no laws uh, governing genome editing to allow him to be imprisoned. He was imprisoned for practicing medicine without a license. Subsequent to, to that, there was a lot of ethical debate and things and new um, ethic, bioethics um, standards uh, adopted and uh, a specific law brought in to basically say what he did, what now, which would now say what he did was illegal. So you're not allowed to implant a genetically modified embryo into a woman. So that, that's really all I can say. Unfortunately, uh, we would love to know more, but we don't. Okay, let's move on then to the next question, which is from Peter Sozu. Um, so he says this is for you, Robin, but I think um, others might want to chip on in on this. Um, with respect to regulation, could a billionaire set up a research facility for heritable germline editing on a private island? And um, and I suppose the follow up question would would Pete go there um, for a conference for his holiday snaps? No, sorry, Pete. Um, but um, Robin, if you want to take that on, and then we'll 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 move to. Um, whether Nora would want to work into such a place, and um, perhaps, and and then to um, to Pete and Vardit to reflect on the um, ethics. 
Well, well, of course they could. I mean, they would have to, you, you would have to import the rele relevant expertise as well as all the materials and equipment and, and presumably have individuals who are seeking treatment, whether it was some um, heritable or somatic or whatever. Um, but, you know, I'm assuming that, you know, like, like most uh, billionaires, they, they're quite, want to be quite public pe people, not all of them, but, um, they would probably at some point want to promote their activities. And once that happens, I hope they would be ostracized, that's all. So I, I you know, obviously it can happen, but um, if they're condemned by the international community and the media, then uh, maybe they would think harder about doing that. If it, you know, if it, they were doing stuff which was going to be definitely unsafe. Uh, which uh, is Sarah, can I jump in on that? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Um, after the Chinese incident or the birth of the twins, there was a lot of writing about rogue science and rogue mm -hmm. scientists. There was even a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine about how to regulate rogue scientists. Um, I, I find the notion uh, very interesting and challenging. And it, it invites me to, uh, to raise again the issue of the scientific culture that we live in. Mm -hmm. and how our young trainees are taught to package their research proposals for grants and to pitch their publications uh, in academic journals and to the media as, you know, crossing a barrier, the first time that something's done, innovative, sexy, shiny. And what is the message we're sending to the, as a society, to the scientific community, that being the first is an achievement, that that's where the Nobel Prizes are, that's where the prestige is. Uh, do we send the message of responsibility in a similarly powerful way? I don't think so. No, um, and so in a way, uh, all science is somewhat rogue science because we're always racing to some imaginary uh, finish line that nobody actually <laughs> traced by, but science is so much today about the economic impact and the innovation that it leaves sometimes behind um, the ethical considerations that we're discussing here today. So rogue science is not just a millionaire on an island. It happens in the best universities and the best labs, and it requires a profound cultural change and a different kind of social conversation of the type that Pete's organization and that you got Sarah are promoting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, actually JK was in effect a, a rogue scientist in an island because he was in Shenzhen, which is a, a city which where they are supposed to be doing all that they're supposed to be uh, pushing things forward they're making re you know breakthroughs um, that's that's why the city was basically set up and has expanded so dramatically over the last few years um, and he was surrounded by other entrepreneurs and people trying to push boundaries he himself was rich so he probably paid for a lot of what he did himself um, uh, and so that meant, in a way, he wasn't quite as subject to the normal rules as, as most people would be trying to do anything uh, clinical uh, approach like that. Um, so I was just going to let Nora come that. in. Sorry? I was yeah. going to let Nora come in now, actually, Robin. So, Nora, um, what do you think about rogue science and also this idea of a research facility on a private island? Would that, would that appeal to you and your colleagues? Um, I, I don't think so. I think for me, it wouldn't appeal. I prefer to work more collaboratively. Um, but yeah, I do think um, scientists are quite often uh, taught to be completely altruistic and everything they're doing is to benefit other people. But I guess like any other sector, you have different personalities. You have some people who are just curious and people who want to push boundaries um so i guess yeah it's just how do we keep all personalities and all scientists and their their thought process how do we keep everybody to the same ethical standards that's the big the big question and um yeah just commenting on what fard had said about how all science is kind of uh a uh, rogue science like I'm writing a lot of grants at the moment and you're told like you have to show that this isn't just incremental work you have to show that it's completely um novel and you know pushing boundaries and all of this sort of stuff but especially in, in this field like 
it, it, incremental is good. We every every experiment we do learn more. Um, yeah, so that should also be be celebrated as well. I think. Yeah, absolutely, Pete. Did you want to come in on this question before we? Move yeah, I think I'm one? just just to um, perhaps add a sort of slight technological dimension to it, and and maybe to um, just kind of segue into Bardit's um, invitation to comment on her presentation of what happened. I mean, when recombinant DNA technologies were first um, developed, you could probably get all of the people who could use them into a conference center on the California coast. And that, that was pretty much the case with um, SLMR in the 1970s. But the situation is very different now. I mean, it's one of the things that was said about CRISPR, Cas9, that it kind of democratizes science because it doesn't require huge resources and it's it requires some basic biology. Now, I think that was probably over egged. I'm sure, in fact, I'm sure that's, that's the case. But nonetheless, the number of people um, who are capable of, of use, making use of technologies and the number of places where they can get their reagents, for example, and, um, uh, and, and, and the facility with which they can design them is, has, must have increased massively. And, there are, and it includes a lot of people who are no longer sort of socialized in, into the Republic of Science um, as uh, a lot of uh, previous generations of, of, of scientists would have been. Um, I mean, you, you presumably you don't know everybody who turns up to a scientific conference and listens to your papers, Robin, for, for example, or Nora, um, or, or what they might be there for, or what they might be doing with that information. Um, so I think there is a there is a kind of, um, in a sense, as a victim of of, of science's own success in expanding uh, that that um, that scope. Um, just to kind of segue into what Vadeep was saying earlier, um, you presented the um, way in which the successive reports had effectively kind of pivoted from drawing a boundary to setting out uh, a pathway um, to, to a certain extent. And, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly where I fall on this, but it does seem to me that, that it's less of a, one should be a little bit um, critical of just presenting that as a sort of acknowledgement of the inevitability of um, the technologies becoming available and think of it, uh, the extent to which these um, actually bring about the um, development of the technology. So they create what some, um, uh, some people would describe as a sort of socio-technical imaginary that, that acts as a kind of target, if you like, and, and, and um, uh, envisages a world in which these technologies are already uh, available as a, as a which has a sort of pull um, rather than simply um, it being a, 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 a an unfolding process without without any agency thanks okay we'll move on now to the next question which is from Cheryl Vanderpool and I will apologize to anybody whose name I read out because I can pronounce the name Smith incorrectly on a good day so um, her question is how and who will decide when a medical need for germline genome editing is compelling enough what if one country's medical ethics board um, finds a particular need compelling and another country finds the need is not. Will people travel to where their need will be deemed compelling? So I don't know who wants to take that one first on medical um, tourism and also who makes the big decision. Um, so let's go to, um, we'll go to Vardeep first and then to Pete and then Robin can come in with what he thinks that um, WHO think. Um it's an opportunity to plug in a, a couple of papers that our group wrote about what is considered a serious disease. So many of these reports say very explicitly, if the day comes that it's safe and efficient and we've had the societal, the famous societal debate, it should only target genes that are known clearly to cause a serious disease. And the question of how to define serious in a way that is operationalized in policy has been haunting us for decades. Because the same question arises for pre-implantation genetic testing, for prenatal testing, 
for carrier screening, for a host of other genetic technologies that we've been told should only be used for serious disease. So I think it's time for us now that uh, so much of the international policy landscape around responsible implementation of heritable editing uh, relies on this notion of which conditions are targeted and we should limit them for the, not just foreseeable future, but maybe forever to, to um, serious diseases, it's really time to expand this conversation. Uh, my research team is working on it. We have a few papers in the pipeline. Uh, we just held an expert workshop on this. And one of the fascinating uh, findings was this. In the clinical uh, context, where clinicians have conversations with prospective parents, a lot of people don't want to define serious because they want this to remain a totally subjective term uh, correspond to prospective parents' desires, values, maybe traumatic experiences within the family. They don't, they want to keep it vague so that it remains very subjective. But at the policy level, if you're going to offer public funding to certain interventions, you need a clear cut definition. You can't leave it open and subjective and, and interpreted by each family. You must have thresholds of what deserves funding, what deserves to be permitted or banned. So there's this inherent tension between wanting to keep it vague and having to define it that I think will be a key policy challenge for the next decade around heritable genome editing. And I'll leave it at that because I'm sure everybody else has uh, something to add. Pete, I'll let you come in next because I'm sure that you've um, discussed the, the, this issue many times. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, this question of medical need, I mean, I think one of the things that I was trying to do in my presentation is, is, is kind of challenge the notion that a child that was not yet born had a medical need. Um, because um, whilst the, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of gene therapy applications that Robin's committee talk about treat people who are affected by disease and they can make them better or they can make them worse if they go wrong, um, no child needs to exist. It exists because, because its parents, its prospective parents, want to bring it into the world. And, and the, the question then is not really one about treating disease. It's about choosing what kind of people or what characteristics it's all right to have when, when, when you're born. So, um, I mean, this is really the, <clears throat> the second of the questions that I raised, this, this question about the diffusion um, and the expansion and what you might think of as the sort of function creep of genome editing uh, technologies if, if they get over that initial innovation hurdle. And I, 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 I sort of, I don't like, really like to think of it in terms of defining, firstly, sort of disease versus, versus sort of non-disease applications. Um, because at the level of the intervention, um, at the molecular level, what you're effectively talking about is, is choosing one variant rather than another, one allele rather than uh, a different one. And everything else that's built on top of that is really a kind of construction about whether, um, which is not to say that those things don't determine the, the condition of the, um, the, the future person. But what, what, I'm, what I'm saying by that is that um, how you think of those things in terms of standing as a reason for using a particular technology. It's really about how you kind of construct it. So I don't really want to think about disease, but I want to, I want to sort of pose the question, what is a good reason for using genome editing technologies? And that will depend really very much on um, a whole range of circumstantial uh, factors. And, 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 and of course it really doesn't make sense at the individual level. It makes this, this question about what you would do makes sense only really at a, at a species level. Um, uh, in other words, it's 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 really about choosing, uh, you know, what what comprises what sort of characteristics comprise the sum of people that are um, that are around. So I don't I don't really uh, think of it in those in those sort of terms. Okay. Um... And just before we um, I'll let Robin have a say, I'm just going to so I've noticed someone has, has commented um, in the Q&A to say, um, Anna Hallgarten, um, don't we have such a subjectivity about serious already in the UK, which has worked up until now, um, where what is serious is determined by our regulator, the HFEA, and has indeed changed over time? Um, 
as as the the list of conditions that people apply for which conditions they can use it for um so robin i'll let you speak now um well that's actually you know the hfa is, a, is an example uh and how they treat pgd etc um i think our, the who committee felt that this was really something that was a decision that has to be made within each jurisdiction that's going to allow this to go if they're going to allow this to, um, to go ahead um, but there needs to be, uh, again, another of our recommendations was that there should be, um, you know, uh, some attempt at least to get uh, international coordination on this, um, because there will be medical travel, as the questioner originally posed, if it's something is allowed in one country, not in another. Now, that already happens for other things, and so why shouldn't it happen for this? As long as it's what's being done is being done in a jurisdiction where there are good regulations which protect the individuals who are being uh, treated or uh, any children born, et cetera. So that's my, my short answer. I, I agree with quite a lot of what Pete says in that um, personally, you know, I think you know, that in a way there's too much focus on serious genetic disease. And of course, the reason why that's done is because um, that's how um, clinicians particularly think of things. They always think of risk versus benefit and um, uh, but it's a very different question when it's a when it's about a um, a child not yet born versus um, treating a patient. So in a way, it's clearer for somatic gene therapy than it is for heritable gene therapy. Um, and of course, when we're using te new techniques where we don't yet understand the risks, and particularly when we are talking about, um, and it relates to another question I noted that being asked about, we don't have enough knowledge about human genes, uh, genomes, and genetic variation to always make uh, um, decisions about what, what's a good target, if you like, target gene to be manipulated. There are some where we have very clear idea and sickle cell disease would, would be one of those, uh, but there are others where we don't. And actually, you know, JK chose CCR5 for which there's a lot not understood. And so that was one reason on a scientific technical basis why that was a really bad choice. But, Okay, I think in the interest of time, we'd better move on. I think we could probably spend all night on that question. Um, but I'll go to the next one, which is from Francesca Ferranzo. Um, and this is for everybody, she says, um, when is the matter to have a child? Reasonable alternatives might include gamete donation and adoption. A typical ethical objection is to what extent the society is compelled to grant the prospective parents um, the right to have a biologically related child um, so what do the panel think about that? So, um, Pete, do you want to go first on this one? Um, yeah, I mean, it strikes me that that's, that's a, a, an observation, which, which is absolutely right. I mean, that is, that is precisely the, 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 the sort of question um, that, that we need to grapple with, you know, to, to, to work, because you're not, you're not simply dealing with the provision of a service to people who can consent to it and and uh, or refuse it um but you're dealing with the complex interweaving of interests um some of which are expressed by people some of which some some of which are expect i mean the, the interesting thing about these these treatments is always that you you see people in front of you um and their needs as, as, a, as a clinician I'm not a clinician but I, as, as, as I imagine this, this situation you see people in front of you and you and you, you, you recognize their their, um, their their interests and their needs and their, their preferences but um, so there's a tendency to sort of think about the sort of high impact low frequency kind of effects and not necessarily the sort of high frequency low impact consequences that, that sort of ramify through um, society um, in terms of, you know, the effects on uh, other people's access to treatment, the effects on the use of resources, the effects on um, the way in which um, people who have particular genetic endowments are treated, all these things. Um, so so um, I, I, think, I think that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's precisely the right kind of question to ask. And of course, that's why we have rules and legislation is because it, it is the job of society in general to stand in for the interests of people who can't speak up for themselves in other, and, and in, in this case for um, potential future citizens. 
Um, and that's the sort of origin of, of this notion that we have of ethical regulation, um, which is not really about simply protecting uh, the interests of, of consumers of, of services, but about protecting um, the interests of people who will be collaterally affected and the interests of society more generally. Robin, do you want to come in next? Well, I just want, I want to sort of, so, I mean, we're talking about the parents' right to have children with a genetic connection. And we, of course, we're familiar that, very familiar that with uh, mitochondrial replacement techniques, particularly in the UK when we went through this. And, you know, parents, it's such a strong feeling that, you know, they will carry on having children who have disease. Even, you know, they know they're going to get each time and they'll keep on doing this because they're so desperate. Just maybe one day they will have a, a healthy child. Uh, what about the, um, so the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights says everyone has the right freely to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. So if the techniques are there, why shouldn't uh, potential parents have the right to, to use the technique? So that's a question for you and for Vardit. Thank you. Yep, it. Um, I think the, the, last, uh, the, the last bit of the conversation touches on the tremendously important uh, weight that our culture gives to genetic relatedness, which plays out in the way that Pete and Robin just described parents desperate to have genetically related children. But you in the UK have lived the other side of this. Uh, children desperate to know their genetic origins in the case of sperm donors and now egg donors and you guys have banned anonymous donation based on these interests. So this notion that genetic relatedness is important to us as human beings, that it constitutes an, a critically important part of our identity, that it's perhaps necessary for families is tremendously uh, challenging from an ethical perspective because we live in a society where all, of this, all these technologies also create a big emancipation of families. And if you look at same sex families, single parent families, families through adoption, they feel some of them attacked by this notion as if the, this weight that we put on genetic relatedness devalues the kinds of families that they are building. So does herit so if, if, uh, if you're a same sex couple and your child only is only genetically related to one of you, uh, this, this whole notion of third party um, reproduction. Um, so does, um, if we acknowledge the importance of heritable uh, germline editing, do we promote this cultural message that genetic relatedness between parents and children is indeed so important that it justifies taking all these unknown risks, that it justifies taking risks to go into the future and force us to do this multi-generational follow-up that we don't, we don't know how to do. We were kind of reinforcing a message that is already ethically very problematic in our society. Uh, does that mean that people don't want it? No, of course they want it. <laughs> and the fact that, as Robin said, the technology is there, you need justifications to say no. That was the starting point of my presentation. Uh, but at the same time, I think we need to acknowledge that this uh, recognition of genetic relatedness as a, an extremely powerful force is not without a price tag and is not without a problem. We need to acknowledge it because the majority of people have spoken in multiple empirical studies. They said that that matters to them. That's what they want. But we, as bioethicists, we need to also step away from it and acknowledge the complexity of the message that it sends to many other types of families in our society that are just as valuable and just as families as those um, created in these ways. I think it's, it's another discussion that could go all night. Um as well. So we're going to move on. Um, this is it's very frustrating when I could just sort of, if only I was just sit, sitting now with a glass of wine in the pub and we could, we could carry on all night, I'm quite sure. So um, Leo Capella um, has a question. Um, I think Robin could take this one first and then others can chip in. Where would you say neurodiversity and disability rights come into the discussions around genome editing? Was that something that your committee on WHO took on board? Uh, well, yes, we did. And we, you know, we were uh, um, um, definitely, um, you know, we, we talked to representatives of disability communities. We, we were very, you know, we, we concerned about this and, then, and again, messages that things give out. So if you have someone who's disabled, we don't want them to get the message that this is some, in some way, you know, an issue, a, a something that, that there's something wrong. Um, 
uh, it, it's, you know, um, I guess my own, my own particular feeling is that, you know, we have, um, there has to be respect for people with disabilities. We have that, um, and you see, um, you know, in parallel with the development of all sorts of techniques which um, help people and avoid disabilities and things, you've also got much better awareness of the issues, um, increased facilities for people who are disabled, um, all sorts of things going on, events involving disabled people. So it's 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 a, another one of these issues which is very, the things going both all directions, but. Uh, whatever you promote, you have to uh, keep in mind that there's always going to be people who have disabilities, neurodisabilities or physical disabilities, and um, there has to always be a respect for those individuals and, and, and how, they, how they are treated and dealt with and, and facilities for them, rights for them, etc. Um, so that, you know, re reducing, in a way, the, the number of people with a particular issue should not reduce our respect for those who will have those issues. There's always going to be, there are always de novo mutations, there's always going to be people born with disabilities. You, you can never evolve that, avoid that. So there always has to be um, respect for those people and those communities. Does anybody else want to come on on this one or shall we move on? Um, um, it, it's exactly the complementary aspect to what I just said about genetic relatedness. In a way, yeah. using uh, gene editing in this way says there are two things that are extremely, that are important enough to justify the risks, having a child that is genetically related and having a child without certain traits. Now, how we define the scope of these traits sends the strong uh, um, yeah. social message that has been acknowledged decades ago around prenatal testing as the expressivist arguments, the expressing a hurtful message for those already living with us with this condition. Totally agree with Robin that one does not entail the other, but this is the same cultural challenge of using these technologies to promote a certain message and then say, oh, but that's not really uh, as, uh, as important as we, uh, we seem to say. So in a way, we're, <laughs> we're kind of contradicting ourselves. You're trying to, to, to keep sort of a balance between two conflicting messages that both on the relatedness side and on the disability side is a very challenging dance to, to try and do. Okay, so the next, oh, Nora, did you want to come in there? Sorry. No, I was just agreeing with, with the other two panelists. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, um, to tackle this next one first, Nora. Um, so um, since uh, CRISPR technology can be more dangerous than dynamite, an anonymous attendee says, um, could it be possible to enforce licensing restrictions in the procurement of any um, or all the equipment, and I think they mean substances, involved in uh, genome editing and replicating um, technology um, with individuals meeting strict qualification um, criteria to be able to access that? Do you think that would be at all possible? Um. I feel like the stable door is already open. Like you can already buy at home kits for doing your own experiments. Um, so I think it would be difficult to, to, to regulate that going forward. But also, I guess that is the, the question. Like, um, so CRISPR can be, could be as dangerous as dynamite, but also there may be a lot of advantages. And also in other contexts, like in non-human contexts, like in agriculture, um, ecology, that sort of thing, there, there'll be advantages. So how do we um, facilitate the progress in, in, in other fields? Um, yeah. Does anyone want, want to come well, back, Robin? I just on so intellectual property rights, which I touched on very briefly. I mean, there are some companies um, uh, who have developed genome editing technologies or reagents um, who, in their patents, say you cannot use that, this product for, for example, um, uh, heritable genome editing. Um, now, how well those patents would, would hold, how universal they are, um, it's not clear. Um, in fact, some of them aren't, and we know that already. Um, I mean, it's one way of controlling a, a domain is to have patents, but it's not a very effective one in, in this sphere, as, as Nora said, because a lot of you can get a lot of reagents easily. Um, I would turn the question around another way in a bit. It's how can you actually make, um, when, when there's a clear benefit from using the technology, how can you make it accessible 
to everyone who might need it. So the bigger problem for the WHO committee was not how can you use these techniques in rich countries uh, in the West who are well resourced, um, where the health systems are very good and well funded. How can you use them in poor countries with low resources um, where we need, uh, there is a strong need for capacity building, sharing of products and reagents and methods uh, and expertise. Um, that was the problem that we were in a way more concerned with. If you make things accessible, um, more, much more equitable way, then uh, I think that's the way to, to think about things, not, not make it too restrictive. Um, Peter or Vardit, do you want to come in on that one or should we move on? Uh, well, I, no, just to say, I mean, you, you have to think about both, of course, but this isn't a problem that, that is peculiar to genome editing. I mean, this, this is a much more uh, general kind of problem and, and um, you know, this, the solutions all kind of lie in the same places, I think, probably. Yeah. The stem cell field is an obvious one, which is just rife with all this road clinics and operators. Okay, um, so the next question is from um, Stefan um, Jarabek, and this is for Robin. Um, so he's thanking um, you and the WHO for all your work. Um, and he says, it's clearly better to understand the risks and benefits of heritable genome editing. Um, continuous basic research is necessary. Please, can you comment on whether the WHO agrees that basic research into germline gene therapy can continue in states where it's permitted by law with, an, with approval from um, bioethical committees and given appropriate oversight. In other words, is there any fundamental shift from previous recommendations made and released by the US National Academies, ASHG, ISSCR, and other respected professional bodies? Quick answer, uh, no, no shift. We, are very, we were very supportive of basic and even preclinical research in this whole area, whether it's somatic or, or heritable. Um, there, was no, there was nothing to say we weren't. Um, we, in fact, um, yeah, I would argue that uh, you know, more countries should get involved, and that involves uh, changing rules, um, for example, to allow creation of embryos for research, which is only permitted in about eight, eight countries, I believe. So um, it, it's very hard to do the research on heritable genome anything if you can't create embryos. So good news for Nora then. Yeah. Uh, Pete wants to make a comment. On Pete. I was just going to say, I, I think it's probably worth making a little bit of a distinction between the kind of research that Nora does, which involves understanding the early developmental stages of embryos through um, using genome editing tools. And the kind of research that um, in, in effect could very easily be put into practice in, in a clinic. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I say this because um, obviously uh, Junkui He was basically applying a, a very early sort of proof of concept bit of research but in a clinic, because, because that proof of concept research had been to do with editing the CCR5 um, gene. And it, it reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, the distinction between uh, reproductive and therapeutic cloning, which is really a bit of um, linguistic digitation, um, because really the difference is not in what you're actually doing. The difference is only in whether or not you happen to transfer the embryo into uh, a, a recipient. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I think it's, it's important to be aware of the kind of dual use, if you like, of, of, of certain kinds of research, even though it may be badged as basic. Yeah. I mean, some, um, of the, some of the science came out of China on, on editing human embryos was, if you like, it was with this sort of preclinical idea. They were testing whether you could uh, alter globin genes, for example, to treat thalassemia. Um, and, you know, but, you know, it, given that, the, I mean, Nora can answer this one, Given that for her research, uh, it's important to have uh, techniques that work efficiently, um, then having something that's efficient and safe is necessary if you're going to go anywhere near clinical heritable genome editing. And so um, for her, it's not so important. I guess it's safe, but it's really important and sufficient. And that's, that's most of the, the battle is actually making it efficient and accurate. Nora? Uh yeah. Sarah, I just wanted to jump in to mention that in Canada, we have a federal law uh, that 
uh, as a part of the criminal uh, legislation that bans not just reproductive use, but even research with no intent of application that applies uh, genome editing to, to the germline. And so technically Canadian scientists doing the kind of research that Nora does could end up in prison or be fined, I think half a million dollars. Um, and uh, the scientific community here has been uh, saying, you know, this starts struggles research, this slows down our efforts to understand exactly the kind of questions Nora described. Uh, and when the day comes for application, we will be behind. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm a part of a group uh, of lawyers, um, ethicists and scientists arguing uh, for a change in this regard. But our entire premise is that you can draw a line between research and clinical use. It's not a slippery slope. At some point, you do implant an embryo in a uterus, and that is a very distinct point that you can stop and not do. And it does not justify uh, a blanket ban on research that has so much potential to do good in uh, art, uh, assisted reproduction in general and understanding of development of disease, et cetera. So Canada is one of those, uh, I think, not great examples of legislation that goes too far. We may be very well protected from a Chinese scenario, but we're losing a lot in the process. So yeah, and a very different skill set in planting an, uh, an embryo as well. Um, Nora, do you want to come in? And you can have the last word because we're very cl close and short on time now. Yeah, so in the beginning of my talk, I was I was saying how we had to, first of all, pick what gene we were interested in. So we chose OCT4, which has a, a role in stem cell biology and, 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 and early embryogenesis. But if we had chosen the, a gene involved in sickle cell anemia, then are we, as long as we then still stopped the experiment before the 14 day limit, that would be basic science, you know, and we, we didn't ever intend to implant it. But then I guess that uh, work in another jurisdiction might not be considered basic science. So I think, you know, the choice of the gene that we used meant that it was very much um, basic research. Um, but in theory, you just select another gene and, and, and use a different guide RNA, and then potentially you could be in a different scenario or a different interpretation of what the intent of the experiment is. 